Papers in East Asia. I'm Jacques Delisle. I'm the director of the Asia program at FPRI, and I want to thank my colleagues here at the Wilson Center, Robert Daly and the Kissinger Institute and Shihoko Goto, and the Asia program uh, for being uh, such generous and, and helpful co-organizers and co-sponsors uh, for a second uh, year of our annual Asia program conference uh, at FPRI. Um, recently, developments around the world Scotland's referendum on independence from the United Kingdom, uh, the rise of ISIS as a brutal entity exercising state-like power over large swaths of territory, Russia's annexation of Crimea, and the re-eruption of conflict between Israel and the Palestinian territories have raised new doubts about the state of the state. These have not been so prominent in East Asia, but those problems, those issues do exist in this region as well. Some of the issues that we'll be talking about today involve subnational entities, those with special international status or transnational ties, or those that have aspirations to such status, uh, and maybe even uh, established states uh, that seek uh, to demote their rivals from full state or state-like status. These issues include Beijing's decision about the chief executive election in Hong Kong and what that tells us about the broader political development there, uh, concerns in Okinawa, which remain a focus of long-running controversies, including disputes over the U.S. military presence and long-simmering nationalist uh, and ethnic sentiments. In Xinjiang, where ethnic and religious unrest have been rising, prompting Chinese authorities to assert links to international terrorism and to move forward uh, with a quite strict anti-terrorism law nationally. Uh, and the interesting historical controversy over the defunct kingdom of Goguryeo, uh, and, uh, which has led to alarm about how China views uh, the peninsula, the Korean peninsula. Other questions concern existing or prospective supranational regional arrangements. Uh, these include new, new uncertainties on the Korean peninsula, history questions that still complicate Japan's relations with its neighbors, and challenges and opportunities for the region's traditionally most robust multilateral body, ASEAN, uh, and uh, the many causes of those concerns, including the fraught disputes over the South China Sea, and of course the long-running question of where Taiwan fits in the international and regional order, uh, and uh, its possible approach to relations with the mainland as a new presidential election looms and the possibility of a return of the Democratic Progressive Party. Uh, to uh, power. On the other hand, many of the risks and challenges in the region stem from frictions among traditional nation states, Japan and China most prominently, but others as well. Uh, resurgent nationalism has reinforced the political importance of the region's most powerful nation states as principal actors and have fed international tensions in the region and created additional challenges for U.S. policy. U.S. policy toward the region, of course, must grapple with all these developments, uh, key components of Washington's agenda, the pivot or rebalance in security affairs, and the pursuit of the Trans-Pacific Partnership in Economic Affairs have the potential to rearrange substantially the patterns of cooperation and friction in the region. We have an extraordinary group of speakers gathered here today for a full day session to engage these issues. We've grouped them into panels that focus on subnational actors, subnational entities, supranational or regional institutions, and U.S. policy toward the region. But before turning to the panels, we'll have an opening keynote address from Ambassador Jay Stapleton Roy. I can't think of anyone more appropriate to open a symposium on this topic, and no one less in need of an introduction to this audience, but I'll give a quick one anyway. Uh, Ambassador Roy is Distinguished Scholar and Founding Director Emeritus of the Kissinger Institute on China and the United States here at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. He was born in China, where his parents were educational missionaries, and spent much of his youth there during the Second World War and the Revolution. His career in the Foreign Service spanned four and a half decades and included participating in the negotiations that led to the establishment of diplomatic relations between the U.S. and the People's Republic and assignments as the U.S. Ambassador to China, Indonesia, and Singapore. He also served as Assistant Secretary for Intelligence and Research. After retiring from government service, he joined Kissinger Associates, where he became Vice Chairman, and then joined the Wilson Center as the inaugural head of the Kissinger Institute. He serves or has served on, in board and senior advisory positions with many of the leading policy institutions in Asian affairs here in Washington and beyond, including CSIS, the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, the National Committee on U.S.-China Relations, the Asia Foundation, and many others. Ambassador Roy thus brings to the, our topic today a wealth of practical diplomatic experience, a policy thinker's perspective, and his inimitable incisiveness as an observer and analyst of the region and the challenges and opportunities facing U.S. policy toward the region. Please join me in welcoming Ambassador Stape Roy. Thank you, Jacques for that introduction, and good morning to all of you. I confess I have been struggling 
in my own mind to define what this conference is all about. There's a, um, Jacques referred to the fact that I'm essentially a practical diplomat in my experience, not a political scientist. And we start talking conceptual issues of national orders and regional orders and subnational entities, my mind tends to um, glaze over. Um, so I'm going to begin, I'm going to focus on issues of regional order and begin with the simple and work up to the more complex, uh, perhaps. Let's begin with some relevant considerations because I always like to um, get the facts out on the table. You all know all of these facts, but I think they're worth repeating. East Asia brings together the interests of many of the world's largest and most powerful countries. In terms of population size, the number one, the number three, and the number four countries are located in or have vital interests in the region. That includes China, the United States, and Indonesia. And India, of course, is just over the horizon. In terms of military power, the United States, China, Russia, and Japan rank among the top military powers in the world. And South Korea, Indonesia, and Vietnam have significant military capabilities. North Korea has also developed a limited nuclear weapons capability, which it has begun to use to threaten its neighbors. <coughs> if you look at the 25 largest economies in the world, as listed in the CIA's World Factbook, we find that China now has the largest GDP in the world, measured in terms of purchasing power parity, followed by the European Union and the United States. Each of these top three economies has an economy exceeding $17 trillion in size. The next two major economies are Asian, Japan, and India. 21 of the 25 top economies, excluding the individual members of the EU. So this is not just listing the top 25 countries, because it lists the EU, and then you have Germany, and Italy, and Britain, etc. So I've knocked out the members of the EU, and looked at the top 25 economies from that standpoint, and we find that 21 of the top 25 are from Asia, the Middle East, Africa, and Latin America. The combined GDP of these 21 countries is $13 trillion larger than the combined GDP of the United States, Canada, Russia, and the EU. When I last did these calculations two years ago, the differential was $3 trillion, not $13 trillion. So the gap has widened significantly in the last, in just a few years. 13 trillion, incidentally, is larger than the combined economies of India and Japan. So we're talking about a very significant differential between the non-so-called Western economies and the, uh, and the Western economies. Japan here, however, is, is, is listed as an Asian economy. This is not the way the world looked 30 years ago. This diffusion of power in the world is reflected in the nature of the new organizations that are becoming features of the international scene. The roster of these organizations, and since this is an informed audience, I won't spell out the acronyms, include the BRICS, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, the ASEAN Plus Three, the Group of 20, the East Asia Summit, the ASEAN Defense Ministers Meeting Plus, the Shangri-La Dialogue, the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, and the BRICS Bank. 20 years ago, these organizations did not exist. The United States is a member of some of these organizations, but not of quite a few of them. Not only is the world in transition, but the tran process of transition in East Asia has speeded up since the global financial crisis in 2008 and especially since the leadership change in China two and a half years ago. The question is, is the United States keeping up with these changes, or are we mired in an effort to protect the status quo while ceding to others control over the direction of change? 
This is an issue I hope that you will explore in the discussions today. The evidence suggests, in my view, that the United States is still adjusting to the challenge of dealing with a different sort of China under its new dynamic leader, Xi Jinping. <coughs> I share with many other observers the belief that China under Xi Jinping is behaving differently than China under its earlier leaders, and in many ways is providing a d dynamic style of leadership that is altering the way the United States needs to think about East Asia. In the two years plus since Xi Jinping assumed China's top leadership position, he's moved boldly on both the domestic and foreign fronts. Domestically, he's moved so boldly that people are wondering whether he has the power base necessary to protect his position when he is goring so many uh, sacred tigers and flies, as he puts it in terms of the anti-corruption campaign. Um, internationally, he's pursued a muscular foreign policy in which protection of China's territorial claims, sovereignty, and territorial integrity are major factors. And he confuses observers because he doesn't, he's not easily compartmentalized. He's combining elements of Dungist pragmatism, Maoist ideology, and Adam Smith's devotion to the market. So we haven't seen this type of, uh, uh, of approach before. And he's proposed this concept of a new type of great power relationship between the United States and China designed to head off destructive strategic rivalry. Under President Xi, China has also moved away from Deng Xiaoping's idea that China should keep a low profile, not grasp for leadership, and essentially concentrate on trying to develop its economy. China now boasts of having a proactive foreign policy. This is a term that the foreign minister has used on several occasions. And President Xi has launched a whole series of proposals that have a distinctive Chinese brand identification. At the very least, this pattern of activity suggests that China under Xi Jinping is seeking to carve out a leadership role in Asia that is equal to or greater than that of the United States. If we stop and think, all these new ideas coming out, they're coming out of China. This is quite different from the proposition that China is seeking to drive the United States out of Asia. While Chinese leaders may, in their heart of hearts, prefer to see a major reduction in the U.S. role in East Asia, in my experience, they are realistic enough to realize that for the foreseeable future, they lack both the capability and the regional support to bring about that outcome. But China does have the capability to contest the U.S. position as the arbiter and guarantor of East Asian security, a role the United States has played since World War II. If China ha indeed has this ambition, and if you read the China White Paper on China's military strategy that has just been issued, I think you would probably come to the conclusion that they do have this ambition. Well then, it's going to pose a challenge to the United States in at least two distinct but interconnected areas. The first is a conceptual one. If China's rise gradually forces changes in the Pax Americana, that has been a vital factor in the East Asian success story, what can emerge to replace it? Probably not a Pax Seneca, but if the United States no longer has the dominant position navally and, and, in, um, and in air power that we have had for the last 70 years in the Western Pacific, what is the new order that can assure stability and prosperity? It's a big question. And secondly, can a different stable order be crafted in East Asia where the disparities between the various players are so great, far greater than in Europe? You really do have a central kingdom 
of China, which in population terms dwarfs all of its neighbors. And I'm talking East Asia, I'm not talking uh, Asia more broadly where India comes in, in, into play. Uh, so the question is, how do, you, how do you structure a regional order which can balance these disparities in both size, population, economic strength, military capabilities? It's a big challenge. In thinking about this question, we need to adopt a longer term perspective than we normally do in the United States. I would argue that for the foreseeable future, the United States has the capability to keep current arrangements in place, but they won't necessarily be as effective as they have been in the past in providing for regional stability. Moreover, whatever China's ambitions are, it has not yet launched an overt effort to overturn the Pax Americana and to usher in new arrangements more to its liking. But we are seeing clear indications of what may lie ahead. We have a lot of proposals coming out of China now, which have implications that haven't begun to be explored. And I'm going to touch on some of these a little later. Some think the Chinese goal is to create, recreate an East Asian order modeled on earlier dynastic models. In my view, this is a hopelessly uh, wrong way of thinking about the issue. Uh, just as the United States cannot create a Western Hemisphere where the Monroe Doctrine has some relevance, China cannot recreate a past East Asian order uh, in which you have a central kingdom and tributary relations with countries around it. China now must function in a Westphalian system in which both it and its neighbors all jealously guard their independence and sovereignty. Modern weapons, moreover, make it dangerous, even for major powers, to resort to the military tactics of earlier historical periods. We are more likely to see a multipolar world with a number of powerful actors and a larger group of lesser but strong subordinate players. Certainly that's the case in East Asia, where you have a lot of very strong, powerful countries. This is not the Western Hemisphere, where the United States, for over 100 years, was simply the dominant player. East Asia, you have a lot of countries that are potentially contending with each other, uh, similar to Europe. And in Europe, history has showed that efforts to dominate the region by one power precipitate bloody wars and fail. And so far, that's been the, the pattern in East Asia. Japan's effort to establish an East Asia co-prosperity sphere failed as part of a bloody war. So the question is whether a stable balance is possible within such a configuration and whether the United States can operate effectively within a multipolar world. The United States lacks a tradition of balance of power diplomacy. Nor does our political system consistently generate leaders with the grasp of world affairs and the experience necessary to implement such an approach. Our experience on the international stage and our disposition as a country, which George Kennan characterized as a legalistic, moralistic approach to foreign affairs, is better suited to bipolar situations where you have white hats and black hats, good guys and bad guys, to put it simply. Uh, we don't operate so effectively in gray areas where it's not sure or clear how to distinguish the good guys from the bad guys. After World War II, we took on the role of a global balancer, bearing the principal burden in both Asia and Europe of not letting communist expansionism shift the balance in favor of the socialist states. In doing so, in this bipolar context, we use the classic tools of balance of power practitioners, forming alliances and fighting wars to keep the balance stable. The Russians did the same, forging the Warsaw Pact, establishing alliances with China and North Korea, and intervening militarily in Hungary, Czechoslovakia, and Afghanistan. With the collapse of the Soviet Union, the role of the United States has shifted. 
Our recent wars have more to do with ideology and resources, not with balance of power considerations. Our post-Cold War presidents are foreign to geostrategic thinking. Their backgrounds simply didn't prepare them for dealing with a global order in which the United States was a key player but had to understand the interconnections between all of these disparate parts of the world. We recognize the need to balance China's rise, but we are using legacy alliances rather than forging new ones or coming up with new security concepts that would be designed to assure a stable order in East Asia. We're hoping that the old system, <coughs> if kept healthy, as we are actually doing, will be sufficient to the task. And we're becoming more cautious and risking combat with significant foes, which is sensible in my view. China cannot step into the US role as global balancer. Even if it aspired to, it would be decades before it could credibly assume the role and world conditions are unlikely to be conducive to any country playing this role if the United States loses the will to continue bearing this burden. There will be no global balancer under those circumstances, and the international order will consist of an amalgam of various regional and sub-regional orders determined by the dominant players in each region. Now the question, which I'm not going to go into, but which is highly relevant, is does the United States have an economy now which is capable of sustaining the global balancing role that we did in the past? I would argue that we don't have an economy that's capable of doing that now, and that therefore while we are trying to pretend that that's not a factor, in reality it is a highly relevant factor, and I'll touch on this um, uh, a bit in my further remarks. China is far from ready to take on global security responsibilities. In addition, Chinese nationalism is driven by the view that the international system has given inadequate attention to China's core interests. This sense of grievance is a burden on China's foreign policy because it alarms China's neighbors who are concerned that a stronger China may seek to settle old scores. In other words, when the weak person gets strong, you worry that the person has a chip on their shoulder because of the way they were treated when they were weak. Not an impossible scenario. Moreover, China has to consider multiple security threats and not simply those on its specific borders. On its western frontiers, China's security interests intersect and potentially collide with those of Russia in the now independent states of the former Soviet Union. It's interesting in this respect the Chinese President Xi Jinping floated his proposal for new Asian security and cooperation architecture at the May 2014 meeting of the Conference on Interaction and Confidence Building Measures in Asia, an organization where only seven of the 26 members are located in East Asia. In other words, it was, he was probably not thinking about East Asia predominantly in making that proposal at this conference because it wasn't the right conference to talk about an East Asian security order of this sort. The other 19 members of this organization are located in South and Central Asia and the Middle East, and most of them play very little role in terms of an East Asian order. This brings us to the second challenge, which is whether we are prepared to commit the resources necessary to compete with China, whose GDP growth is outpacing that of the United States, and the immediate indicators are not encouraging. I've touched on this before. The situation was summed up nicely last May, uh, excuse me, last year, in a majority staff study by the United States Senate Foreign Relations Committee on the U.S. rebalance strategy. And I quote, the United States has successfully moved forward with the initial phases of implementing the military aspects of the rebalance. But given the broader strategic and policy goals, it is essential that the non-military elements also move forward with equal speed and weight. An unbalanced or unresourced approach to the rebalance threatens to undermine the goals of the policy 
and consequently the prospects for greater prosperity and security in both the Asian region and the United States, end quote. That's from the Senate majority. In other words, this is a Democratic report. This was not a, um, a bipartisan uh, report. But in my view, this is an accurate statement of the policy, of the problem. There's an additional factor, which is that when the rebalance strategy was formulated, it was based on the assumption that we would be drawing down our military involvement in the Middle East and that Europe would remain peaceful. And we're now finding that drawing down our military involvement in the Middle East is more difficult than we had anticipated. And we now have a major, big power, dangerous confrontation in Europe between Europe, NATO, and Russia on its borders. This has enormous resource implications that we just prefer not to talk about. But the question is, can we sustain <coughs> the rebalance if our resources are being pulled to other regions of the world because of unanticipated crisis, crises in, in those areas? This leads us to wrestle with the question, of what kind of order can preserve a stable balance in East Asia. And China is obviously a central factor in this equation. China's growing wealth and power provide fertile ground for the emergence of overweening ambitions to dominate the region. There's a lively debate underway in China, indeed, over how assertive Beijing should be in carving out a dominant sphere of influence economically, politically, and eventually in the military sphere as well. China's ardent nationalists are not shy in pushing for ambitious goals. And yet we should bear in mind that in sharp contrast to the Soviet Union, China's economic development has not only become the engine of growth in East Asia, but has vastly improved many aspects of life in China, even while creating health-threatening environmental degradation. Seeking to inhibit China's growth would be bad policy and bad morality. Rather, the goal should be to increase the incentives for China to behave as a responsible power, even when its impulses are to let China's interests override those of its neighbors. East Asia, in fact, offers suitable conditions for achieving this goal. Three factors are necessary, although perhaps not sufficient. First, a level of solidarity among the ASEAN countries that can keep China from pursuing divide and rule tactics in the southern part of East Asia. Second, a strong American presence at the level necessary to inspire confidence in China's neighbors and among US allies that China does not have a free hand to browbeat them. And third, a reinforcing structure of regional organizations and mutually agreed legal principles that can deter irresponsible behavior by China, the United States, or anyone else. If there are going to be legal principles and rules of order in East Asia, we have to play by those rules and not simply try to impose them <coughs> on other countries. The first factor, ASEAN solidarity, is in place. But it is facing new challenges. Solidarity has been weakened by the heating up of the dispute over islands in the South China Sea, where only four of the ten members of the, um, of the ASEAN group have equities in the game. Additionally, progress has stalled on negotiating a code of conduct for the South China Sea, which China and the 10 members of ASEAN committed themselves to as a goal in 2002. 13 years have passed and we're not getting progress on trying to get an actual code of conduct for the South China Sea, which could inhibit some of the provocative behavior that's taking place in the region. The second factor, a reassuring U.S. presence, is also in place. Nevertheless, as noted earlier, it's excessively weighted on the military side, and U.S. support for giving Japan an expanded security role in East Asia and elsewhere is not welcomed by the Republic of Korea, which is the United States' second important ally in Northeast Asia. Despite expanded U.S. PRC military to military contacts, moreover, strategic rivalry between China and the United States is continuing to intensify. So these issues require constant attention, and they raise the question of how you structure this 
new order. The third factor, a reinforcing structure of regional organizations and legal principles, is still a work in progress. A lot has been accomplished in this area over the last two decades. But here, an important transition is taking place as well. Ever since the Asian financial crisis in 1997, the ASEAN countries have taken the lead in creating the new economic and security architecture that has emerged in East Asia. The view that the relatively weak ASEAN nations, rather than the powerful countries in Northeast Asia, should take the lead was enshrined in the concept of ASEAN centrality. That no one had to resist proposals coming from ASEAN, but if relations between China and Japan are not good and one comes up with an idea, the other one may just instinctively um, oppose it. And that could apply to the United States as well. But China has now brushed this concept aside and is launching its own ideas, such as President Xi Jinping's proposals last year for the creation of new security and cooperation architecture in Asia and in the Asia-Pacific region. This concept was repeated in China's released, uh, recently released white paper on military strategy, which speaks of, I quote, promoting the establishment of a regional framework for security and cooperation, but provides no details. What are we talking about? A new collective security arrangement that is supposed to replace existing security arrangements, or is this something that would be concurrent with? We don't know the answer to that. While the Chinese have not yet clarified what they have in mind, in my view, President Xi's terminology is reminiscent of the Conference on Security and Cooperation in Europe that emerged in the latter part of the Cold War. This organization existed alongside NATO and the Warsaw Pact. In other words, this was a supplementary approach to security and cooperation. And it created, first of all, a, a conference support architecture because there were periodic meetings. And then when the Soviet Union unraveled, it was changed into the Organization on Security and Cooperation, uh, Cooperation in Europe, which continues to play a role in East Asia. It's dealt with, uh, excuse me, in Europe. It has dealt with such issues as arms control, border management, combating terrorism, co conflict prevention, military reform, and policing. My point is not to endorse this proposal, but to suggest that in the face of changing circumstances, it's prudent to liberate the mind and think creatively. Is, in fact, there room in East Asia for a region-wide approach to new security and cooperation architecture? The ASEAN Regional Forum is a talk shop. It's not really designed to, and staffed to deal with real concrete issues. Uh, I think East Asian specialists would be well advised to take a closer look at what's been going on in Europe. It's quite clear because we have all sorts of problems in Europe now that the Organization on Security and Cooperation in Europe can't handle, but nevertheless it has played a positive role in many different areas under conditions of considerable confrontation at various times between the major players there. The instinctive U.S. reaction has been to resist such proposals. We are keeping our current alliances in good shape. But our major new initiative has been in the economic trade sphere in the form of the Trans-Pacific Partnership, whose success is not yet assured. In my view, a good step toward creating a more positive order in East Asia would be for China and the United States to work together with other countries in the region to strengthen the rule of law in the maritime space in the Western Pacific and to establish ground rules for avoiding confrontation. The 2002 Declaration on the Conduct of Parties in the South China Sea, which was negotiated between China and the 10 ASEAN countries, we were not a party to that agreement, but it was an excellent beginning and set down principles that if they had been observed by the various signatories of the declaration, would have avoided much of the rise in tensions that has been taking place in the South China Sea. But the military-to-military -military confidence building measures that emerged from the U.S.-China-Beijing summit last November set a good example. And 
For its part, the United States needs to try harder to secure ratification of the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. This is a major gap in our approach to the region. We talk about respect for rule of law, and we don't ratify the basic law that has to do with uh, ground rules for operating in the maritime space of the Western Pacific. In my view, one of the oldest diplomatic tactics, often unused, is look for what other people, competitors, even enemies, are saying, and see if you can borrow elements of that, package it in ways that are compatible with your own interests, and then put it forward. So you don't end up with a confrontational approach, but you use an amalgamated approach. President Xi Jinping has pointed the way, for example, in his recent work conference speech, in which he said that China should, I'm quoting, promote peaceful resolution of differences and disputes between countries through dialogue and consultation, and oppose the willful use or threat of force. Not bad. He went on to say that China should firmly uphold China's territorial sovereignty, maritime rights and interests, and national unity. OK, well, that's a Chinese national interest. But he said, and it should properly handle territorial and island disputes. Well, I think that's a proposition that I would certainly endorse. Proper handling of territorial disputes is what all countries should engage in. So in my view, the United States can buy onto the idea that promoting peaceful resolution of differences and disputes between countries through dialogue and consultation, opposing the willful use or threat of force, and properly handling territorial and island disputes is the right way to uphold China's territorial sovereignty or any other country's territorial sovereignty. In the same speech, President Xi was reported to have stressed that China, and I quote, should be keenly aware of the protracted nature of the contest over the international order. Now, in my view, it's unfortunate that he chose to put this in terms of a contest. Sensible people everywhere recognize that the post-World War II international order needs to be adapted to take into account the new realities in the world, just as regional orders need to adjust as circumstances change. Far better to have put this as a cooperative process in which the major countries of the world, including the United States and China, should work together to readjust the international order so it is more consistent with the realities. And I mentioned some of those realities at the beginning of my remarks. We now have a completely different economic balance in the world. And yet the global institutions, the international financial institutions, are based on a past reality, and they haven't been adjusted. In recent decades, East Asia has been in large measure a success story. And in my view, a common interest of all of the countries of East Asia, and those who have important interests in East Asia, such as the United States, should be to keep it that way. So I, in my view, we shouldn't exaggerate our differences. What we need is boldness, willingness to act creatively and unconventionally in pursuit of an outcome that is based on common interests of the various participants. That's not an impossible goal, but it means we have to be willing to think differently. And I'm disturbed, quite frankly, that the United States seems to be resistant to new ideas and is not able to come up with the inventive new ideas that might contribute to forging this type of a new order. But an even bigger problem, which I am worried about, is do we have the resources to back up new initiatives? When Xi Jinping launches, you know, an Asian infrastructure investment bank, he talks about putting $40 billion into it. And these new Silk Road, Silk Belt initiatives also have major funding behind it. The United States used to be able to come up with that type of capital. Nowadays, we can. We're able to support our defense presence in most parts of the world, but in every other area, we are frankly grossly underfunded, and that was the point of the Senate report that came out um, last year that I quoted from earlier. So in my view, we have to assess the strength of the U.S. economy 
not in terms of whether it's growing at 2 or 3 percent, but in terms of whether it is capable of generating the public funds necessary, necessary for the United States to carry out a major powers international security and foreign policy interests. And frankly, from that standpoint, the U.S. economy is very weak because it is not generating those funds. And I think that our understanding of our domestic circumstances have to start thinking realistically about that. In my view, our economy is capable of generating the funds necessary for us to play a major power role in the world, but frankly, we're not doing it. And if you think historically, we went into World War II grossly underprepared. And the reason we were underprepared had to do with domestic politics. Because once we got into the war, we showed very quickly that in fact we had the capability to generate the military equipment necessary. But for two years of the war, we fought with totally inadequate military equipment because we simply refused to step up to the challenge. Britain was the same way in Europe. We can all understand the factors that contributed to that, but I think we have to differentiate between human-created under-resourcing of necessary national security interests and a political system that can realistically assess the challenges and come up with the funds necessary to support what needs to be done under those circumstances. This needs to be part of our public dialogue and I think it is also relevant to the discussion that you all will be engaging in today on the um, topic of this conference. Thank you. I'm not a law of the sea expert, and it's a very difficult area to, um, uh, to discourse on without knowing a lot more of the details than I do. But my recollection is that one of the major reasons why we were hesitant about ratifying the treaty had to do with seabed resource exploitation. And we didn't think the terms of the uh, of the treaty were ad provided adequate protection. There were subsequent changes to the law of the sea, and I have been told by experts that that issue was addressed. So quite frankly, I am not certain why the Congress is so dead set against ratifying the treaty. I, I tend to agree with you. I tend to think that it's, it's, it's very uh, uh, pointed special interest they're delaying it. And isn't, isn't that a portent for what's going to happen with TPP? It, it, it's a portent of what could happen with TPP. But I think we have to avoid rushing the judgment on this question because previously the president had not been putting his weight and influence behind an effort to get the trade promotion authority necessary to conclude the negotiations. He's now doing that. We have seen in repeated instances that when the president weighs in heavily in favor of something that is important for the U.S. national interest, it can actually sway the outcome. But it doesn't always do it. In the case of the um, North American Free Trade Agreement, it made the difference. We wouldn't have gotten that agreement if the then president had not weighed in and used the power of the office to push it through. Uh, I think the president is now doing it, and the question is whether he will be successful. We don't know the answer to that yet. In part, it's, his problem is he's running out of time. Um, so that's an important factor. Yes. Yeah, th thank you for your speech, Ambassador. I had a question about generating resources in order to maintain our role in the region. Do you think um, 
in terms of uh, generating versus the will to use those resources to be engaged at the level we need to be, well, where would you see that balance? And do you see any downside risks in Asian economies themselves of being able to um, um, grow at the rates that you talked about initially in the opening part, China, the limits on uh, Japan, the limits on uh, India, the limits on the Republic of Korea, et cetera. Do you see any um, limitations for those economies? All economies, all countries, you know, have choices of guns versus butter and, and have to worry about uh, uh, sustaining economic growth. Um, what worries me in East Asia, where I think most of the economies of the region have shown that they have the ability to sustain positive growth in the type of open environment that has emerged in East Asia uh, in, the last, in the last 30 years, with the, with, the, with the end of the polarization of East Asia between the communist countries and the non-communist um, countries. What worries me is a trend toward rising defense spending. Uh, I think we have the possibility for an arms race in the region. Uh, all of the countries claim they don't want this to happen, but the realities are that if China continues to modernize its military as rapidly as it is, and without any defined definition of what is enough, for example, at the 18th Party Congress, a phrase that really struck my mind was in the opening sentence of the military portion, where he said that China needed a powerful military commensurate with its international position and suitable for its defense and economic development needs. Well, suitable for defense and economic development needs is what most military spending is justified in terms of. But commensurate with the country's international standing, what does that language mean? I mean, to me, that's an open-ended ceiling. Uh, that's, uh, as China rises, it needs to have a more powerful military just because it's a more influential country. Uh, I find that disturbing. And I find, in reading the Chinese white paper on, on defense strategy, you don't have a sense of what the limits are. For example, historically, China has never controlled the maritime space of East Asia. Uh, when China was the central kingdom and had tributary relations with the countries, it was largely either inconsequential maritime things like the Ryukyus, who paid tribute, uh, or it was the land-based neighbors of China that had that type of relationship. But not since the early Ming Dynasty uh, did China have the capability navally to try to uh, be the dominant maritime force in East Asia. Uh, and you have big maritime countries like Japan, Philippines, Indonesia, uh, historically were not part of this Chinese-dominated sphere of influence. In fact, it was the refusal of the Japanese to pay tribute that resulted in the Mongol invasion of Java back in the, in the, uh, 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 at, at the end of the Yuan Dynasty that failed. They were successful in landing in Java, but they then had to retreat and, and go back. Uh, they tried to invade Japan failed. That's where the kamikaze um, uh, uh, thing came into play. Uh, so for China to set the goal of becoming a more dominant force in the maritime spaces of East Asia is a new development that means that inevitably there will be some sort of challenge to the Japanese and U.S. interests because that's where we have been dominant in the past. And yet the white paper doesn't address that question. Uh, where, 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 where's the line between, uh, you know, how many battleships does China need, you know, in order to be sure of its defense posture, but without getting into the problem of the security dilemma. Uh, and Xi Jinping and his remarks at the, at the, um, anniversary of the Five Principles of Peaceful Coexistence in June last year, I think had some very important language, but it's not reflected in the white paper. He said at that conference that we cannot have one country secure and other countries insecure. 
We cannot have one group of countries secure and other countries insecure. And we cannot sacrifice the security interests of some countries in pursuit of absolute security for your own country. Well, that's a statement of the security dilemma. And he seemed to be conscious of it. And I don't see it in the Chinese military strategy. So in other words, these are big issues that are going to have to be addressed as, as, as we see how things play out in, 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 the, in the Western Pacific. And that, that's one of the themes, I think, that you'll be looking at in the uh, discussions later today. Yes. Um, thank you very much. It has been um, very stimulating and very, very much needed. But in one of the recommendations you made, uh, you put emphasis on, um, if you like, new forms of organization in East Asia. And isn't one of the problems here that the, the Asian organizations or Asian-generated organizations have always been based on voluntarism and consensus rather than on, um, if you like, uh, regional commitments uh, to carry out certain, uh, certain measures and means, as it were, to monitor that, never mind enforce that. Do you, do you see uh, prospects for uh, new kinds of organization along the uh, lines you, you, you suggested from Europe? Do you see signs of that emerging? You raised a big issue, and it's a valid issue. Um, and I don't have an adequate answer for you, but I've been thinking about the question. If you look at history, what you find is that coming up with completely new organizational approaches is usually only possible at the end of a devastating military conflict. That was the case of the Napoleonic Wars, where the Council of Vienna established a new order for Europe that kept peace at least until 1830 or 1848 or whatever. Uh, uh, but it, it, it did stabilize uh, things. And we had the post-World War II effort to establish uh, the United Nations and avoid the mistakes of the League of Nations. But then the Cold War split the world into two halves, and the United Nations wasn't able to play the original concept of the role that it would play. So to sort of come up with a completely brand new approach is probably overreaching because hopefully we're not going to have a type of major conflict that could produce that sort of thing. So then the question is, how far can you go in tinkering with what exists to try to bring it more into conformity with realities? And what we're seeing now is, and the United States is part of this problem. For example, we've recognized that the IMF needs to have a greater role for the emerging new economies such as China. We can't get passed through this through the US Congress. So what we're, ha what we're having now is we're having new institutions, and I cited many of them, emerging to make up for the deficiencies of the existing institutions. But the existing institutions are not yet being reformed to bring them into play. And so the question is, do we want to go down this path where we'll end up getting a more and more complex international order based on vestiges of the old systems and the new systems that are emerging, but which are not general in their application. Uh, and what's the best approach? Well, the United States, quite frankly, bears a major, major responsibility for this. Because probably the best opportunity to really try to restructure the post-World War II institutions occurred with the collapse of the Soviet Union. But the United States was so transfixed by being the sole superpower in the world that we actually became hostile to international institutions because we saw them as potentially limiting our ability to use our unchecked power the way we chose to use it. 
And unfortunately, the way we chose to use it, in my judgment, uh, involves some very serious errors and considerable waste of our national resources in areas that we didn't have to waste them. Um, but nevertheless, that's the way we behaved. We lost interest in, in arms control, and we lost interest in international institutions. Now we're beginning to focus on the fact uh, that international institutions are a necessary part of trying to stabilize the international environment. But the question is, where are the new ideas coming from? Uh, so I, th I think this is a, a big problem. Uh, and I don't have the perfect answer on how we should approach it. One last question? Uh, no? It's, it's uh, often that I, can I abuse this, which is um, one of the things that was in the fourth plenum document was a statement that China should take a more active role, that China should take a more active role in shaping international rules and institutions. Uh, is, is that a, a portent of something significant? Where do you see that going? Especially in a moment when China has not been willing to participate in the arbitration with the Philippines and other sort of established means of dealing with these legal disputes. No, I think it is an important development, and it wasn't simply um, uh, you, you, in his work conference remarks, uh, President Xi was quite blunt in saying that China wants to have a stronger voice uh, in, in, in developing the new rules. And China's approach is an amalgam of uh, joining and utilizing existing institutions and trying to reform them in ways that are more compatible with China's interests, but at the same time also creating new institutions where needed. So that you can't say China is a status quo power now because it is openly talking about changing the international system. Uh, and, and as I quoted, it's put in terms of a long-term struggle over the international system. But at the same time, China is buying into the system while bringing in new elements that were not part of the old system. So it's both a status quo, shall we say, and a reforming um, uh, 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 country. But in my judgment, it's not revolutionary. China is not talking about throwing out uh, the old international system. It's talking about adaptation. I think that change and adaptation needs to be part of the way we think about the world. And what I'm disturbed about US foreign policy is it seems too much status quo oriented. Because the world is changing in ways that require changes in the way that we deal with the world. And we're not adequately factoring that in to the way that we think about the world. And that's one of the themes that I've been trying to convey in my remarks today. Thank you all. Mm -hmm. Ambassador Roy for a terrifically wide-ranging and provocative, uh, stimulating talk that covers much of the ground that we will be exploring in more detail with the rest of the day. So I think we're taking a 15-minute break now. Is that right? Yes. We'll reconvene at 10.30 uh, with our first panel on uh, subnational actors and challenges. Thank you.